Good morning, and welcome to Laycott Presbyterian Church as we gather together on this first Sunday in March to worship our Lord. Every week I mention it, and I will continue to prayerfully consider supporting some service agency, people working to care for the needy during these difficult times. Even as we emerge, we hope, from a pandemic, there are still people struggling. So if you can supply an organization that will help them with non-perishable goods or for some kind of financial donation, it would be greatly appreciated. We still need a few of you to pick up your offering envelopes. It's down to a precious few. Uh, just this morning, we had somebody come and get uh, some envelopes, and that's a good thing. Again, Tuesday and Friday mornings, as a rule, uh, except for this Tuesday, again, it will, the office won't be open. But Tuesday and Friday mornings, you can come. The secretary will usually be there. Otherwise, call, let me know, and I will make sure that you can come and get your envelopes. Our per capita is $35.38. We encourage all members to pay their per capita so the church doesn't have to. We continue our Lenten study this evening at 5.30. I will be sending out, uh, if I haven't already, a link to everybody so that they can join the Zoom um, <clears throat> so that you can participate in the study. This year, as I mentioned before, we are looking at the way Jesus healed, reflecting on what that healing meant. And then we are examining the healing that we need and how the Lord can still heal us today. If you haven't been on the distribution list and would like to participate, give me a call and I'll make sure you get the link. Finally, uh, during the season of Lent and through Easter is the uh, giving of one great hour of sharing. And this is a program that uh, at PCUSA, our denomination, it's a way for you to support programs in over a hundred countries around the world. This is a way for you really to get involved in mission work in a, the broadest way possible. And if you are interested, just send your donations into the church. Just mark them as one great hour of sharing. That concludes our announcements. Let us begin our worship together.
again, good morning. Let us pray. Dear God, in this season of Lent, break us, humble us, so that we may see you better, so that we may follow your way. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. We will now go to our first hymn, which is Be Thou My Vision, which as far as I'm concerned we can do every week. The lyrics for the hymn are on the website if you want to sing along. <laughs> Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess. We confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, our words, our deeds, by all that we've left undone, and by all that we have done. In, in your mercy, forgive what we've been, show us what we should be, 
Help us to change so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Oh, we, we try so hard. We try to control things, to know things, to do things as we want and think we need. But in the end, we fail. And then we hurt. God forgives. God still loves. God wills to heal. This is why I can say to you this day, in the name of Jesus Christ, that we are forgiven. Put aside the broken human things. Go against the human brain. Become new. Become alive. Let us come before the Lord now with the joys and the concerns that are on our hearts this morning. We'll begin with the joys. Mary Weaver is our prayer person this week. 
And frankly, she could have fallen into the concern category as well. She remains at Fairmount Homes, and she so much misses being home. She's hoping maybe, maybe next week, she will be able to go home. She's doing better, but she's not all the way there yet. And there's, she's wrestling and living with so much uncertainty. But she didn't want me to tell you that she so much appreciates the cards and calls that have come her way. The beautiful flowers this week were given by Shirley Musselman in memory of her daughter Beth and her husband Fred. So as we reflect and celebrate, reflect on and celebrate their lives, let us hold up Shirley in our prayers as well. Mary Alice High this week has a, learned that she has a new great-granddaughter, Kira, which is a wonderful piece of good news. And today is Betty Sauer's birthday, and I believe, frankly, she's a little older than 45, but she's still going strong. So let's celebrate Betty on the occasion of her birthday. On the concern front, Vicki Birkins, as many of you know, had a procedure, and she's recovering from it. There's still a lot of pain and still a lot of uncertainty. So hold up, Vicki, in your prayers. Karen Cummings continue, continues to struggle with the loss of her mother and the loss of her dog. We'd ask you to pray for Karen. And to get us out of our own community and the people we know, and thinking broad, more broadly, let us pray for the people of Myanmar who are struggling to have some of the basic rights that we have in this country and are paying for it in some cases with their lives. Let us pray. God, God, your son once saved a wedding by turning water to wine. You will us joy. Help us to trust the possibility of joy. Grant us the wisdom and the strength to rejoice. Even when it seems a silly thing, Today, we thank you for Mary, for the lives of Beth and Fred, for Kira, for Betty on the occasion of her birthday, and for all us and all others whom we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. Merciful God, you know that joy is not the only word for your creatures. You feel with us pain, sorrow, worry. And as you know best, you seek to show us the way to healing. Help us, Lord. In particular, help Vicki and Karen, the people of Miriam and all others whom we lift up to you now in the silence of our hearts. And now hear us as we pray the prayer of Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now turn to Him 213 in the Cross of Christ, I Glory, which again has the lyrics available for you on our website.
Our scripture passage today is taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, the first chapter, beginning with verse 18. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Those who are to call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord, our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to say something that you're probably not going to like. Our faith, in other words, your faith, is pretty foolish. Throughout all of human history, human beings have over and over again made attempts to think their way to God. And the results are often kind of satisfying. But what we have then ended up with, really, is a God in our image. In Paul's days, day, Jews, and remember, he was a Jew, he says he, they want signs. They want God to demonstrate God's strength. You know, assert authority. Demonstrate, it, reveal grandeur, show strength in the way we know strength. Now, Greeks, in Paul, Gentiles, Greeks, he uses those interchangeably. They want wisdom, he says. They want a neat, nice, rational God. And then comes Jesus. And with Jesus, a total inversion of human thought, of human values, an inversion of the very image of God. A cross. I mean, it's hard for us to consider in this 21st century what the cross would have meant in those days. Nowadays, we, some of us wear crosses around our necks, and we have beautiful crosses as the one behind me, and it becomes, the cross has become an object of often beauty and veneration. But in Paul's time, in Jesus' time, the cross was something shameful, reserved for the worst of the worst. Reserved for criminals, the very worst criminals, the criminals you wouldn't even want to consider or think about, for rebels. It was also a mark of empire, the Roman Empire, with all the oppression that went with that. Let me tell you, the cross was something foolish to have at the center of a faith. You know, for people in those days, traditionally, they, gods couldn't get hurt. They couldn't be hurt. They were above all the muck and murk of mortality. 
And therefore, in Paul's time, as he says in this letter, the good news of the cross which he is proclaiming was seen as utter nonsense. He says, the cross is a sign that trips up Jews and it's foolish for Gentiles. Well, what about us? Yeah, we think we, we think it's kind of beautiful. And some I see pop stars wearing crosses around their necks when they probably don't have a clue what the faith is all about. Maybe, I don't know. But what do we really think? Or do we really consider what that cross represents, what our faith represents? The cross was only the last and biggest of the signs that were so foolish. Forgive your enemies? How many of us find that easy? Does that even make any kind of rational sense? Be last in order to be first. Turn the other cheek. You know, these are nice words and we say them. Do we believe them? Don't we really want to be first? Who wants to be last? And how often do we easily turn the other cheek when somebody's hurting us? You know, nowadays people would look at that kind of behavior and say, it's soft, it's weak. So do we really, what do we think about when we look at the cross? What do we, is our faith, does it make sense? Well, okay, why would God choose the way of, of a cross? Well, it was to reveal that God and God's Son reject the usual broken human way. The way of power, the way of demands, the assertion of hierarchy, Instead, Jesus inverted hierarchy. This is the Lord, the Son of God, and he says, I came to serve, not be served. He became like us, but not in all of our self-assertion, our wanting to be served, but rather in our vulnerability. You see, the cross reveals a God choosing to care, to heal, to love, all the way to the most shameful death imaginable in, his, in that time. A foolish death in a wonderful new kind of life. Okay, but why was all this even necessary? This cross, this Good Friday. Well, Paul quotes Isaiah, and you know, this is one of those times where you have to know your whole Bible to understand what this passage is really getting at. Where the motivation Paul sees in the cross, in God's choice of the cross. Because if you look at the passage, it's from Isaiah, if you look at the broader context of those verses, you'll find that the prophet is speaking about how too often people have a lip service worship. You know, once a week, get together, read a little scripture, mouth some pretty words, and then walk out and do your usual stuff. It's kind of a rote thing, you know, you just go through the motions. And the problem, of course, as Isaiah says, is that the worshippers' hearts are as far away from God as they could possibly be, even though they do claim to worship God. So therefore there was a need to strip aside the human way and to force us to wrestle what, with what faith, with what God really means and asks of us. We need to be shaken up in order to open our hearts we need to have ourselves be shocked awake. And Paul says here, you notice he says, for those being saved, you know, being saved, 
Salvation isn't a one-off deal, you know, it happens and then you just sort of just go through the motions. It's a process, being saved. It's something we continually are growing into as we become the new creation that God wants us to be. The wisdom of the world, of people who think they're so wise, and that can be many different people. It can be people with advanced degrees, it can be people who have no degrees but who think that they know better than everybody else. For Paul and Paul's days, you know, the scribes, those Jewish people who knew scripture better than anybody, or the Greek debaters, the philosophers, you know, their wisdom, the wisdom of the world so often proves empty. You all know this probably, but there was a time when everybody thought that the, everything circled around the earth. The earth was the center of the universe. And Ptolemy came up with all these twists and turns to account for the weird motions of the planets and so on. And I well, well, this is truth. This is wisdom. Until we found out that wasn't true, that the earth wasn't the center of the universe. How many times has the wisdom of the world been proven to be wrong? In the cross, God changed the way to God. Now, we are to approach God through faith and belief, not just pure logic, pure rationality. It is to be a matter of the heart and the mind. Paul understood this. Jesus taught this. But we often miss this. Ours is a faith of paradox. We need to hold what seem to be contradictions. When I was teaching, and I was teaching expository writing, where kids had to learn how to argue various points, for the final exam one year, there was a, a thought I had had that I really came to believe was true. So I just gave it to them as one of the choices. The greatest strength is weakness, and the greatest weakness is strength. And I asked them to defend when are the defender opposed this position. That's the essence of this passage from Corinthians. The greatest strength often is weakness in the eyes of the world. And the greatest weakness is often strength. But we don't live that way. We think it's only a muscular kind of strength, a kind of glamorous wisdom that amounts to anything. But you know, maybe, maybe paradox is more real, more true, than neat logic or reason. Okay, let's look at a few examples. Kids, children, little kids, they're not too wise, are they? And Lord knows we all know they're weak. They have to be protected, well, often protected from themselves. They're just little. And we talk, oh, look at the little ones. Riley Braden, five years old, was swimming at a hotel pool. And she was, she was happily paddling around, and she looked over and she saw a family nearby. Two parents and two very young girls. The youngest of which was only 18 months old. And that little girl saw kids in the pool, got interested by the light of the water, and kind of toddled over there and fell in. Right, five years old, assessed the situation. There was no lifeguard. The parents were sitting down in a lounger with their clothes on, fully dressed. And so she knew, Riley knew she had to do something. So she dove down and grabbed the little girl helped her up to the surface and started yelling, I've got the baby. Well, the parents came over, nearly hysterical, took the child from Riley's hands, thanked her, and then immediately left, and Riley never saw them again. But she was given the golden key to the city, which she slept with for a week and would not allow anyone to touch. She showed a kind of wisdom kind of strength that people wouldn't usually expect. 
of just a child that age. And I wonder. Seems to me somebody said, if you don't become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. All right, let's move up a few years. If you've been following the news, you know about Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader. Over the years, as he opposed Putin and the corruption in the Russian government, he was twice convicted, trumped up charges, made no sense. Everybody knew these were just ways to try to silence him. On August 20th of last year, he was poisoned with a nerve agent, went into a coma, and had to be flown to Germany to have his life be saved. Now since that time, various intelligence agencies have demonstrated that Putin and the Russian security agency were indeed responsible for Navalny being poisoned. But as I say, we've been following the news, on January 17th of this year, Navalny went back to Russia from Germany after he had healed. And immediately, of course, he was arrested. Get this, for violating parole. He was in a coma when he was flown to Germany. But he violated parole, so he got arrested. And he's been sentenced to penal colony number two, which is the harshest of their various penal colonies. He has to stand, they have to stand for hours at a time with their hands behind their back and keeping their eyes from looking at their guards. Now, wasn't that foolish for Navalny to go back to Russia when he knew what was coming? He had already been poisoned in his own country. He knew he'd get arrested. He might get killed. And yet, as one publication has said, it's a classic case of David versus Goliath. Because Navalny's move movement continues to grow even while he's in prison. And he's generally regarded as the biggest threat Putin has ever had. And after he was sentenced, he said, hundreds of thousands, they can't all be locked up. And more and more people will recognize that. That moment will come. And then all this will fall apart. And this I believe, that all the corruption all the authoritarian states in history always ultimately fall. They are not ultimately strong. And then this week, Pope Francis, against all of us, went to Iraq. Why? To bring faiths together, to show the people of different faiths can get along in a very unstable country where he's in great danger. So is he foolish? Was Navalny foolish? Was Riley foolish? I don't think so. I think they're far wiser than most of us. Well, maybe that should be our way of living. That God's foolishness Paul says, is wiser than human wisdom. God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Maybe that's the kind of strength and wisdom you should choose. And maybe the next time we look at the cross, we'll see a new way to consider what is the greatest strength. Because the cross shows us a new way to be. Now let us affirm our faith with the same of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. When you go out this week, as I always invite you to do, offer the peace of Christ to everyone whom you meet. And consider seeing them in a new light, seeing yourself in a new light. Look at how they might be strong and wise in ways you never imagined. It's good to be humbled. In your offerings, your faithful offerings through all of this pandemic is indeed humbling. So we thank you for your generosity as a sign of faith and a sign of fellowship. And now let us go to our final hymn, which is hymn 817. We walk by faith and not by sight, the lyrics for which are in the book.